Welcome to the All For Your Life podcast, where you can write a new script for your life and become the hero of your story. I'm your host, David McRae. You are the author of your life. Let's get started. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. Hello, story changers, and welcome back to another episode of the Isolation Inspiration Interview Series. Our guest today is Michelle Julian. Michelle is a coach, energy worker, and gifted guide to thousands, and is the founder of the Julian Method. She is also a highly sought-after massage therapist, practicing Buddhist, and self-proclaimed goddess guru. She is on a mission to help women learn how to embody the goddess that they are. Through developing clarity, confidence, and consistency, they can experience less burnout so that they can step into their true power. In our interview today, you will learn, don't get distracted by the glamour. When we get distracted from our life's purpose, we always get a reminder. Purpose comes through connection with others. And that coronavirus is a reminder that we are not as in control as we like to think. You're going to learn this and so much more in this interview with Michelle Julian. Well, it actually started when I was, I would say, 18. I um, had a dream that I wanted to be a professional ice skater. And it was something that I dreamt of ever since I was a little kid. And I decided that um, I wanted to do this because I loved skating. I loved um, dancing. I loved ballet. I liked all of those things. And so my journey started when I was 18. And I actually was riding my bike to school one day. Um, It was in November. It was election day, 1977. President Carter was elected. And it was really, really slippery. And even though it was slippery, I wanted to jump on my bike anyway. Um, And the first thing that I actually remember was my sister. She said to me, whatever you do, do not wear my scarf and my hat because if you do, I will kill you. They're brand new and I don't want you to borrow them. (laughs) So I did exactly what she said not to do because she was my older sister. Yeah. Hates when I tell this story too. She's like, why do you have to say I'm your older sister? (laughs) Because you are. (laughs) So anyway, I got on my bike. I was riding down this slippery slope and was paying attention, but not really paying attention. And back in those days, we didn't wear helmets. Okay, so I had my little fancy hat on with a scarf. And I'm proceeding down the hill, and a friend of mine is coming the opposite way. And I kind of look, and I'm thinking, what is she doing? Because it's senior year in high school. You know, we skip school some days. I'm thinking, oh, she's skipping. And I got kind of got distracted in, in my head. And what happened was when I turned back to, like, look forward, the wheel started going like this. And I was like, oh, no. And I put my hands on the brakes and I went into a skid like ice on the wet leaves. And what happened was just crazy. I went over the handlebars, literally over the handlebars, smacked my head like in a tree. And back in those days, the signs, no parking sign was on the tree. There was no like pole was on the tree. And I slipped my neck 
Oh, I miss God. my jugular vein and my carotid artery to my brain. As you can see, this is my scar. I have oh, a little yeah. makeup on it, so you can't see it really. Um, by a fingernail. And I woke up with a priest standing over me in the ambulance. And I was just like, oh, my God, am I going to die? And he said, no. You have a little cut on your neck, and you're going to be fine. And I was thinking, I don't know. And then I just kind of went back to sleep, woke up in the hospital with 64 stitches on my neck. I had a neck brace. I broke my nose. I had scrapes all over my face. They thought I had actually a head trauma, so they were doing all these tests. And the nurse said to me, when I woke up, I looked at her and she said, how do you feel? I said, I'm okay. And I looked at her, I go, can I walk? And she says, yes, you can. And I said, oh, oh God, thank God. And she says, don't be alarmed, but your face is beaten up. I said, cause I really, I said to her, I said, I really need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and she's like, okay. And she's like, I just don't want you to be alarmed because it's really bad. She said, you have a neck brace. So can you wait till I have somebody help you? I said, I said, sure, no problem. And so I waited and then somebody helped me and I got out and went to the bathroom and I saw my face and I just started to cry because I wasn't disfigured in any way, but it was just really hitting me that this had happened to me. And all I kept thinking was, am I going to be able to train? Am I going to be able to try out for the ice capades, my dream? And that's all that was on my mind. But then I went back to my bed and the woman said, you know, do you need help? And I said, no, I can do it. And she left the room and the minute she left the room, I just got down on my knees and just thanked God that I was alive because it didn't matter actually at that point. I thought to myself, it doesn't matter whether I'm going to be in the ice capades or not. I'm alive, you know? And so that really was a pivotal moment in my, my life was that, oh my God, I'm not in charge here. You know, I thought I was in charge because, you know, when you're 18, you have this huge ego and everything is about appearances and how you look and you think you're in charge. But I found out really, really quick <laughs> that I was not in charge and that there was a purpose for this. It didn't happen to me. It happened for me. And that's how I started my journey, my spiritual journey, with understanding the higher power, God, what does that mean, and started being really reflective and focusing on the things that were outside of me that had to be looked at and be more introspective, you know? So... And I also found out too during this time when I was recovering, they told me that I actually had a neurocognitive um, disorder from the accident, which means, I don't know if you know anything about neurocognitive disorders. Quite a bit, yeah. It means basically I mix up words. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll say, you know, hamburger, and I really mean something else, you know, and it kind of, it kind of drives some people in my family crazy, because <laughs> they're like, you just said blah, blah. I'm like, no, I didn't, you know, because I don't even know that I'm doing it. So that in itself, on top of the fact that I had to get back into shape, was really um, challenging and humbling, you know, so um, that's really basically my, where my journey started when I was 18 years old. And I really 
understood how much I needed to really think about out of the box, you know. Mm -hmm. Why did you want to be an ice skater? What drew you towards that? Um, I think it was because of Dorothy Hamill and the way I would see her live her life and just seeing her kind of live her passion and wanting to kind of be in her body and experience the world through skating and, and really sharing that you know, kind of that purpose for her. And, and I, I always, I always loved being my body. I used to take ballet and tap and jazz. And it was something that I just really felt that, you know, was going to fulfill me. And, and it did, it definitely did have a fulfillment once, you know, I was there and in it. Um, but again, there was so many things I learned during that process that, um, it kept bringing me back to the fact that I'm not in charge, you know, and so having that reflective purpose of like, what's important to us, right? So, um, you know, that's really the main reason why I went into um, skating is just wanting to be in my body and sharing that passion similar to Dorothy Hamill and I mean, I was a girl then, you know, young girl, and I liked her haircut. <laughs> so um, I'm sure there's people in this audience that are familiar with Dorothy Hamill. Um, so I, I'm not, by the way. Is she a famous athlete, figure skater? Yes, yes, yes. She she was very famous. She had a haircut, and everybody wanted her hairstyle. Um, so is it was the Dorothy Hamill um, haircut. And I'm sure there's people in the audience that have always had a dream that they wanted to do something and sometimes obstacles got in their way. And so um, I feel like I'm that voice for people to have them see that their dreams can come true and um, there will be obstacles on the way and you will be challenged and you will have a really um, messy, beautiful life. But um, you know, you, that's part of life. And if you really want something, then you, you really need to make that decision that that's, that's what I want and go for it. You know, even if it's hard, right. Even if it's scary. So that's really kind of my purpose, I would say in my life, in my um, journey of life period. Um, not just like in my business, but just this, the way I live my life is on purpose. Like I, I really don't do anything that's not purposeful, you know? And that's, uh, that's kind of my mission, I would say. <laughs> yeah. You were talking about your, your neuro impairment. It's funny you asked if I'm interested in it. I've got mm -hmm. a degree in psychology, so I'm very interested in, oh, in neurological great. stuff. So I'd love to get a little bit nerdy on that and find out a little bit more. Cause I, I sense this might not be something that we return to as this journey develops. Uh, can you explain a little bit about, so what are the effects of it and have you found any strategies that have helped you repair or gain back some of that neuro ability? Well, because I'm very physical and kinesthetic, that has actually been an advantage for me because one of the tools a neurocognitive person does is they act, actually move their body to remember the things that they need to remember. So kinesthetically, they visualize and put it into their body. So if I want to, let's say if I want to ski and ski with um, with the ability, I will do a lot of visualization and picture myself before I actually am going down the mountain because sometimes because of the neurocognitive things, they'll 
it, it will have me start with my right arm when it's really supposed to be my left arm because of the way my body goes down the mountain. That, that, that automatic neurocognitive reflex helping you visually kind of picture yourself going down the mountain will help you remember. So it's the kinesthetic techniques that you use as well as writing things down like actually writing things down and listening to things so when i was in school i had to this is what's college because this is when i graduated from high school yeah. when i was in college i actually had to record the lecture and write the lecture and then listen to it again and as I was writing it, I would listen to it and then I would go back and then have to record myself after what I just wrote. Cool. So it was like a three step I'm process. Yeah. <laughs> I spent more time than your average student, you know, studying. And I ended up actually getting um, a 4.0 um, when I did graduate. Uh, but I, I spent a lot of time studying in the library and, you know, just at home. I was just always studying. I always had a book and a recorder, you know, I was always studying. So, um, yeah, so it was really interesting. I, I just thought, you know, well, this is the way it is. You know, I, I wasn't really upset about it and, you know, you know, when I went to um, get tested again to see how I was doing with the neurocognitive, because they, they test your brain to see how they, they said they were just astonished. <laughs> it's kind of funny. They were just astonished that I was able to do all the things I was able to do. <laughs> because it, there's so many limitations to it, mm -hmm. the way the brain works. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not mechanical at all. I yeah. can't put things together and put, I can't take things apart or put things together. Like, thank God I met my husband because <laughs> I'm like, how do I put this bulb on? <laughs> how do I do this? I was just, we, just before we got on here, there was a speaker that came, we ordered it and we were going to use the speaker with my, my laptop for the interview. Yeah. He's like, well, you got to set it up. You got to do this. I go, forget it. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just going back to the regular thing. I'll talk yeah. to you later. <laughs> I mean, it's probably really simple. It's probably really simple, but not for me. Yeah. And I'm okay with that, right? You know, mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. Because, you know, God gave me so many gifts. And I think the, I guess the main gift that he gave me was 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 light was love was joy was happiness my husband told me when he met me the reason why he actually fell in love with me because he had never met somebody so happy <laughs> so i thought okay that's a good reason <laughs> you know i guess he was around a lot of depressed people <laughs> You were talking about uh, going back to the doctors and they were astonished at your, your neuro capabilities and, and how much functioning that you had. What do you put that functioning down to from your own perspective? Do you think it's just this dedication that you have to processing and understanding things or is it anything else? I, I'm stubborn. I would have to say I'm very stubborn. And once I make a decision, that's it. I don't stop. I, um, I'm very diligent that way. You know, if I really, really want to do something, I'm going to figure out a way to do it. Mm -hmm. So my mother would kind of joke about that. Uh-oh, she's very determined. Look out. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take things back to the the beginning of this this neuro mm -hmm. impairment and this bicycle accident mm -hmm. that you have. So we're at the point where 
you're in the hospital and phew, you see that you see the face in the mirror and you have that sort of that shock of of the whole situation the, the shock of what a i guess a near-death experience it is you you're you know mm-hmm. millimeters um from death in terms of where you actually got injured mm-hmm. talk us through a little bit of the process of what happens next you mean from the time when I actually was in the hospital? Yes, yeah. Okay, after I woke up and the nurse talked to me? Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. Well, my sister came in, and she came in to visit me, the one that I stole the scarf. The older the, sister. <laughs> the hat. And the minute I saw her come in, I started to cry. And she's like, what's the matter? Are you Okay. And I said, I'm so sorry, your scarf and your hat is completely destroyed. It has blood all over it. <laughs> and she's like, oh my God. She's like, I don't really care about the scarf and the hat. I'm glad that you're alive. And I just like cried even more because it was like, oh, I know that you're saying that, but that was your brand new scarf and, and hat. How could you like not be mad at me, right? So, but it just, it's kind of like, if you think about that thought that I had, my head was still in the fact that, you know, here I was 18 and it was all about vanity, you know, and how I, you know, how I looked and, And like how people, um, you know, would look at me, like all of those things were just um, still there, even though I have this, you know, this near death experience. I mean, to the point that, I mean, I actually talked to God. I mean, it was one of those, like, come to Jesus. So, um, you know, when I say I talked to God is because I was brought up Catholic and my you know, when I was unconscious, I had this vision, um, basically with God and he was telling, he was talking to me, telling me it wasn't my time and that, you know, I was going to be okay. And that I was going to get married, have a baby and that I had a purpose in life. And, and I just was like me. And he said, yes. And I said, what's my purpose? And he said, light, love, joy, that's your purpose. And then that's when I woke up with the priest standing over me, you know, before that, you know, because I didn't really believe God. And I I didn't even really believe that I had that, you know, that experience. It was like, I felt like everything was a dream, you know, like this, was not real. This was like just a dream. I was waiting to wake up. So I did get um, woken up because, you know, I had to really step up my game to train and relearn like all of my jumps, all of my moves to, you know, basically um, be in the ice capades and audition. And I auditioned and then I didn't hear from anybody until almost like six months. And then I get a call. And um, that's when, you know, my mother handed me the phone and said, you know, it's the ice cream. I was like, oh my God, you know. And um, they said, yeah, we want you to start skating in like a month. I think it was something like that. And thank God I had been training all that time and practicing because, you know, I was just waiting for the call because, you know, I didn't want to do like, you know, the real life. I really wanted to, you know, do the glamorous life and skating like Dorothy Hamill and all of that. And I, and I got that chance and I did it for two years and I was really, really happy um, doing it. And it was, it was quite an experience at 18 years old to be doing that. So. You've used the word dream and Mm -hmm. purpose Mm -hmm. a couple of times. 
<laughs> as the 18 year old you this this was your dream but i get the sense that this isn't where the dream and your sense of purpose finishes for you <laughs> would i be correct in that assumption yes you're very intuitive <laughs> <laughs> I can feel your intuition. <laughs> <laughs> so what then becomes the purpose? You managed to achieve this dream of, of becoming the ice skater. And, and how long does this journey continue for you? How long are you in that place as an ice skater and as a performer, if you like? I was a performer and ice skater for two years. I traveled the East Coast, the West Coast, the Continental. Um, and it was, like I said, it was very, very glamorous, but it was also a lot of hard work. And um, I had realized it really, even though it was my dream, I realized it wasn't the way I wanted to live my life. I wanted... I wanted more purpose, and so I decided not to go back for a third year, and that's when I um, met my husband, my first husband, because I have two husbands. I have an ex-husband and a not husband. Not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> not at the same time, no. Um, so I met him, and... Um, I was very young, 21, 22, and um, yeah, he kind of swept me off my feet. It was definitely like a very romantic, like relationship, courtship, and so I ended up getting married very young at like 23 and um, became, you know, a mother like right away we got pregnant like on the honeymoon and <laughs> and i have a daughter now that's 36 years old so wow. um yeah yeah you look yeah. younger than your age michelle <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you so much i love hearing that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have good genes, the, the Julians, you know. I'm Italian and Irish. Ah, My dad was Italian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mother's Irish. And we ate a lot of really good food. My mother was not a person that um, believed in sugar. She actually hated sugar. She hated salt. And so we had a lot of olive oil. That's why my skin's so shiny. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so meeting him really kind of did that purpose, like, oh, wow, okay, you know, having a family and, and all of that, and um, now there was, like, there was no turning back to um, be glamorous anymore, per se, and be traveling, you know, as an ice skater, um, you know, I was a mother and that was like more important than anything. So mm -hmm. you're probably wondering, okay, wait a minute, you've got another husband. What happened? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just wording the question in my mind. I was like, how do I word this in a sensitive way of <laughs> yeah. what happens with this relationship? You, you've got the husband and you've got the child. Mm -hmm. And now the child is 36 and you have a different husband. So, yeah, mm -hmm. what, what, what develops from this point on, shall we say? Okay. Well, I was so young and I didn't really know, like, what love was. Um, I think that's really the main reason why things didn't work out. I was very young and naive. And um, inexperienced in so many ways. My world was built around wanting to be a skater. And I really didn't have boyfriends. I didn't really date. So when I say you, he slept, he swept me off my feet. I really mean that because I had no clue what was happening. It just happened. And I just had it in my head. I was like, I'm going to marry him. And so 
um, I married him. And um, as we all know, marriage is complicated and it's, um, it's a serious step. And um, it's not like it is like in a dreamland, you know, I, I guess I was kind of dreamy personality. So I had it in my mind that it was going to be a certain way. And, and it wasn't that way at all. And so we ended up getting divorced. And I went back to school. And I ended up getting my degree in exercise science and sports medicine. And my my dream now was to become an actual physical education teacher because here I was, a single parent, divorced, like pick an occupation that you can be there for your child and something that you're going to be passionate about because I loved, you know, my working with my body, moving my body, teaching other people to move with their body. So it was like kind of like a perfect match for me. And so that's how, you know, that unfolded. And then basically going from being a physical education teacher, I actually got laid off after like a year and a half. And I was like, oh God, now what am I gonna do? And my dad said to me, you know what you have to do. He's like, you're going to have to go get a sales job. <laughs> Cause you know, he was working for John Hancock and he said, you know, you can take on my, you know, my, some of my clients if you want. It's like, no, I don't want to do insurance dad. So, um, I decided to work for at the time, you probably don't even remember the name of this. It's called MCI telecommunications. Um, this was not, you know, like anything technical, like per se, but it was MCI telecommunications before um, Bell and all that. And basically I started doing that and I became top salesperson, you know, of that um, for about, I would say it was probably like two, two and a half years I was working doing that and um, loved, loved sales, loved making money. I was doing the you know, the, the six figure thing and being a mother, a single parent, working, traveling, doing all that. And then my next near death experience, <laughs> I didn't tell you about, I have had almost four near death experiences. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to overwhelm you. <laughs> People are like, I don't understand why you're still even living. Um, so the second was when I was actually on a motorcycle with this guy that I was dating at the time and I fell and broke my pelvis um, and ended up in the hospital. And it was a, it was a really, really scary motorcycle accident. And so I was very lucky. I actually watched him. He was on the motorcycle in front. I was in the back. I watched his body go up, levitate it up. He landed on his feet. I was looking up at him. I landed on my butt and kind of crashed down like this. And um, he ran after the motorcycle <laughs> to push the motorcycle from crashing into another person and then turned around and looked at me, ran after me, lifted me up and like brought me over to the side so no one would kill me. It was like, so like, it was like a movie. Yeah. Two wheels are really dangerous for you as well. Mm -hmm. Every time you're on something with two wheels, it <laughs> results in a near death experience. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So there was another like, Oh my God, I almost died. I can't believe this. And that brought me into the next thing, which is the degree that I have now, which is occupational therapy, physical therapy, and massage therapy, yoga and meditation. And um, I, I just couldn't believe how I, I, was, I wasn't really able to walk very well because of the pelvis. 
and I had to do physical therapy. And that's when I was thinking, hmm, I really kind of like this, you know, occupation. This sounds like a really nice thing to be able to learn how to help people feel better and walk and go back to their life. So I decided, you know, to look into it. And I ended up going back to school and getting um, basically three degrees <laughs> with I mean, the neurocognitive <laughs> disorder. <laughs> like I said, a lot of recording, a lot of writing. <laughs> and that's why I ended up with the 4.0. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Yeah. What, what drove you to commit yourself in that way again and again? That's a really good question. Um, when I really think about that question, I think, well, These accidents really didn't happen to me. They happened for me. Um, like I said to you before, I'm very stubborn and sometimes I don't listen. And so you think really God had to talk to me again. <laughs> like, hello, remember I told you of things to do? And so, um, it was another wake up call for me to not be in sales to, you know, um, yes, you needed to support your daughter. Yes, you need to make money, but you have a purpose in helping people with light and love. And so how can I do that, make money and start my purpose, my purpose life, right? So I think that's really kind of why it all happened the way it happened. What have these near-death experiences taught you about life? Um, basically that I'm not in charge. I'm really not in charge. None of us are really in charge. Um, there's something that's much bigger than us out there, whether you call it the higher power or God or Jesus or the angels. Um, yeah, I, I feel that that's really, really the crux of what's happening right now with the pandemic is that we're not in charge, you know, and the people that are in charge, they're not in charge either, really. Um, and it's really scary. And for me, um, I have a lot of compassion and understanding for that feeling because I've had so many near death experiences um, that it feels like home to me to be kind of going through this. And I feel that I'm really helping my clients and my family and my friends to um, help them stay calm and grounded and grateful so i think this is this is it this is the time that we all really need to kind of step up and be be the light you know be the light and um help other people because it's not about you know it's not about us you know it's it's really about, you know, human beings and not about making, you know, making lots of money. And it's just, there's just so much reflection right now. I think people are really starting 
to get that this is real. You know, I know I was talking to my husband yesterday about it and we both were saying, you know, it, the world's probably not going to go back to work in May per se, like we all thought, oh, okay, we're going to take April off and then we'll just get back to, to work the world, right? We'll get back to our normal everyday life. That is not going to happen. That everyday life that we all know is not going to happen. And we're going to have to just do lots of things differently. And yeah. I don't, I don't really think a lot of people really are ready for that. Um, I don't even know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> Because I love touching people and and helping people. So, you know, yes, I can do a lot of my work through the computer, but I like being with people. Like we were talking about this earlier, like, you know, can I get you anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying, Michelle this second near-death experience that the message finally starts to get through of light, love, purpose, helping other people. How does this start to show up in your life from this point? How it shows up is that I value human connection. And how I did that or do that is, I hate to say is I don't think about the money. I just figure, you know, God will take care of that somehow, you know, to the point that my husband's like, it's like, don't you worry about money? I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't. Never have, never will. I want those strawberries. They're organic. They're good for me. <laughs> Just buy them. Stop whining about the extra $2. It's the truth. I mean, there's almost one of the reasons why I almost didn't marry him is because he wasn't going to buy those raspberries or those strawberries because they were an extra $2. And I even said to my mother, I said, Mom, I don't know if I'm going to marry him. He's quivering about $2 with raspberries. She's like, oh, cut him a break. He's a really nice guy. <laughs> Yeah, it's human connection. You can't buy that. You just can't. You can't buy it. Mm -hmm. Kindness. You can't buy kindness. You have to be it. You have to embody it. And I had that opportunity to do that with my clients every single day and I would sometimes actually forget you're going to be really shocked I would forget to ask them to pay me <laughs> because I didn't feel like I was working yeah was helping 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 I've been helping ever since I was I guess really a little girl, I used to help my friends figure things out. They would come to me with their problems. They probably weren't really big problems, but for some reason, I was the go-to person to um, guide, be the guide. Maybe because I had, you know, that near-death experience, and they all just figured, like, God, you know, she almost died. She didn't die. You know, maybe she's the angel that I need to listen to. Um, you know, and I, I really feel like a lot of my clients, because they know, they get to know me on that level, um, they, they appreciate me in a way um, that's just not expressed, you know, through necessarily money, per se, you know, 
even though, yes, I did get paid and yes, I, you know, I've been able to like pay for a house and put my daughter through college and all of that. But like I said, I, I didn't think about the money. I still don't think about the money, <laughs> even though, you know, we all need to think about the money, right? Like we were talking about this earlier, like women don't really even, I think a lot of women have a hard time, you know, asking for more money or money. And, um, you know, it's kind of an, a hard, hard subject with women, you know, sometimes. Like, I don't yeah. want to charge because I'm helping. You know, and I, I can totally relate to that because I was very much like that, you know, especially when I first started out, I really didn't even know what to charge. You know, I think I charged maybe like $25 an hour or something like that, you know, when I first started actually um, helping people. Um, and so now I don't make $25 anymore <laughs> an hour. <laughs> Much, much remember, more than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember, I don't know if you've read Adam Grant's book, Give and Take, but he talks a little bit about uh, the, the sort of the gender pay gap. And one of the things that he's identified in the, the equation, if you like, for want of a better word, is that um, certainly in the private sector, in the, in the corporate world, the difference is partially explained because men just ask for a pay raise more. And even from like the very initial contract negotiations, men will ask for more than women for the exact same job. And mm -hmm. so Adam was sort of suggesting with his research about teaching women and sort of conveying to women, if you just ask for it, you're probably going to get it, but because you're not asking for it, you're not getting for it. And that seems to explain partially the, the pay gap for the exact same job level, certainly in the, the private sector and corporate world where you do negotiate your pay as opposed mm -hmm. to like a, a public sector job where it kind of, it's more just, this is what we're paying you regardless. That's really good advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll have to get that book. Yeah, it's it's really good for a variety of reasons, but there's a there's a little part, um, mm -hmm. little part on that that was just relevant to what we were speaking about there. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the block that stops women from asking? Not just for for money, but I think this block maybe shows up elsewhere. And again, this is a very broad kind of gender sort of kind of brushing of of men are this way and women are this mm -hmm. way. But I think there are True. tendencies that you can spot. Why do you think that block exists for? asking for what they want um i think it's just nurturing conditioning society um you know i think it really kind of depends like on your age you know like for me i grew up i grew up with a father that was the bread earner right and my mother she was the nurturer she went back to work and made money, but he was the bread earner. So I think it has to do with nurturing, conditioning, and just depending on your age, like the chapters of your life. You know, I'm, you know, I'm between the 40s and the 60s. I'm not going to give you my exact age. <laughs> I, can, well, I can work it out based on how old your daughter is, which is why I was so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, sometimes I do give my age out like freely, no big deal. <laughs> I'm X, but um, you know, somebody told me I need to be more mysterious. So I was like, okay, I can be more mysterious. Like, like don't be an open book. I'm like, okay, all right. Like, leave some information to be like, oh, I want to find out more about that person. Like, really, how old is she? So yeah, I really think it has to do with conditioning, mm -hmm. conditioning and nurturing because, you know, my daughter, she makes more money than me and she'll make more money than me in her lifetime. And she's 36. 
you know so i think that um it's a generational thing mm -hmm. and nurturing talking about being mysterious and holding things back you have mentioned you've had several near-death experiences but we've only <laughs> heard about two so far you can maybe keep one of them in your back pocket to be mysterious but would you like to share another one with us to maybe say how this has kind of shaped and guided your journey yes well the third the third one we don't have to get into the fourth one the third one basically was my wake up call when i found out that i had breast cancer so this is after I've been married for a couple of years with my new husband. Um, and I was with a client and she was talking to me about um, going to the doctors, getting tests, things of that nature. And I said, yeah, you know, it's been a while since I had, you know, my breast exams and all of them. she's like, you've got to go, you've got to go, you've got to go. She was like freaking me out about it. I was like, okay, okay, all right, I'll go. So I went and had my, you know, mammogram or something like that. And they called me and said, you know, we think we saw something. We want to do a biopsy. And I was like, oh, okay. And it's like, because sometimes, you know, that doesn't mean anything necessarily yes. that, you know, something's wrong. So I was like, okay. So then, um, I was with that same client actually working with her at her house and we're doing some yoga and, and meditation and stretching and stuff like that. And she said, so how did that go? You know, that the thing I was like, Oh, they said they thought they saw something. Well, did you, did they call you? She was like, so like adamant about it. I was like, I'm like, no, I said, like, they said not to worry. She's like, you need to call them right now. I was like, okay. So I called. And they said, we have to put you on hold. And then they came back and then that's when they told me that I had breast cancer. And I was just like, oh my God, I, I like dropped the phone. I was like, and she like, she had to pick up the phone because I started actually hyperventilating. I couldn't believe it. I was in like shock. Like I could not believe that I got breast cancer because I am health, you know, I'm light, I am love, I am joy. How did that happen? Right? So it was what really I think shook me to the core was getting the breast cancer and, and realizing that even though I did green juice and I was exercising and I did all the things, I still got cancer. And so having that, you know, happen to me, it made me really realize, wow, I'm not in charge again. Like I thought I was in charge. I guess I had forgotten that I was not in charge. So it brought me to my knees, really, actually it brought me to my knees. And I really felt like, okay, what is this all about God? Why? Okay, I'm doing my purpose. So why am I getting the breast cancer? <laughs> you know, looking up like, why did I get this? And I was so, so lucky. I didn't even have to have um, uh, chemotherapy. I only had radiation. And it was a very, very small tumor. It was like, like very small. So getting this, again, something waking me up saying, okay, I'm not in charge, even though I'm doing my purpose. So what is my purpose? If I'm doing my purpose, God, what is my purpose then? Why am I getting this breast cancer? So basically what I dissolved from all of that was that you are doing your purpose. But are you really sharing it? Or are you playing small? 
And that's when I started doing more self reflection and working on all of my skills like the meditation and making sure that I was really sharing it with my clients, with my family, and really kind of stepping it up, right? Going to the next level of being more visible. And that's kind of why I'm here being visible with you. I'm not playing small. I'm playing bigger. So it's basically it. Mm -hmm. But God said you got to play bigger. You got to play bigger here. You got to really share this. I find these accounts so interesting of people who have never been for a checkup or they haven't been for a checkup in, in years and years. And, and it's that checkup that, that finds something. It's these sort of these guidances and coincidences, although I don't really like the words coincidence. And, right. and it's, and it's funny how you had like just small of enough of a tumor to be a tumor but no more than that. It was just like you needed the T word or the C words to be like, ah, but it gave you like the minimum amount required. So they just gave you a little, ah, but then it wasn't something that, it, that impaired you or, or was sort of like threatening to your life. Um, yes. I find these stories dead, dead fascinating. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It was just enough, like you said, to be like, remember, you're not in charge and remember you're here to do your work and making sure people are taking care of themselves and not just in a way that it's like, Oh, I do my green juice and Oh, I exercise more about human kindness and being kind to each other and really realizing that we have on this planet earth for a very short time, period of time we don't really know when we're going to go so when we're here to be really diligent <laughs> and being kind to be really present in the present moment and not to have you know all these ideas thinking that you're going to do this and you're going to do that you know and that could be true that you can do this and you can do that but just don't Forget your purpose, right? Don't get distracted with the shiny objects that are out there, you know? You said your message was to play big. What do you think that playing big is going to look like? It's gonna be a movement, actually. And I'm really creating that as we speak. It's the goddess collective movement. That's the name of it. <laughs> it's for all the goddesses, right? And we all have the ability to tap into our own inner knowing of our own strengths and capabilities. But sometimes what happens is we get lost, we get caught up, we get distracted, overstimulated, and we fall off the path. Similar to my own journey, you know, the ego, the ice capades, always thinking that I'm in charge. And then, boom, the motorcycle accident. Guess what? You're not. <laughs> and then going back to school and learning the things that God wanted me to learn. So I could heal the world, touch people with light and joy and healing. And then, 
boom, now I'm doing my work, I get breast cancer. Wait a minute. Remember, short period of time. What are you planning on doing here? Short period of time. The fact remains, we all age, we get sick, and we die. That's the reality here. So what, what are you really going to leave as a legacy for your family, for your daughter, for your daughter's son? My daughter has a son. So the main theme is collectively create a movement so other goddesses can find their purpose and move through their own limiting beliefs that they can't do more in a way that doesn't have to do with being shiny and egotistical, but to be actually kind, like a kind human being, <laughs> like connecting with each other and seeing how we can help each other, like really help each other. Like this movement that I started about a year ago online, it's grown, it's not huge, but people are really resonating with it. And they're really saying, oh, this is interesting. I'm curious, hmm, what exactly is this? Almost like they don't believe it. And now people are starting to believe, oh, I see what this goddess movement is. We're supposed to help each other raise the consciousness of light, of love, be of service, and don't get caught up with how much money you're going to make. <laughs> so that's really what's kind of evolved into the Julian method, because the Julian method is how to take your own inner knowing, your gifts, and share them with the world, create your own inner movement, your own conscious movement, and then radiate that out to your family, to your friends, to your fellow online entrepreneurs that are out there in the world. So that's really, that's really what God wants me to do. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> What's an essential part or essential ingredients of being a goddess? What's the essential part? Yeah, I'm going to use ingredients because I think there'll be more than one answer. <laughs> so I'm not going to use part, the singular. <laughs> Well, it always starts with being grateful and being thankful for what you have, the littlest things in your life, like waking up to your loved one, you know, um, and Getting the simplest things, like going downstairs and having an egg to make. You know, these things that we take for granted that a lot of people don't have. They don't even have food. You know, I mean, I think this is really what the pandemic is really showing people is how we are so abundant. We have anything at our fingertips. I mean, all we have to do is click a button and Amazon will deliver it. So if we don't start with gratefulness, then how are we going to really be kind? Like if we don't know how lucky we are, how are we going to be kind? So that's really, I would say, the number one main ingredient, if you want to talk about ingredients. Um, yes, is gratefulness. Going to start with that first. Mm -hmm. And coming from a place of service. Mm. 
we have talked about the pandemic a couple times in this conversation and I'd like to take a few moments to focus on it a little bit more and, and, and talk more about the everything that we've been talking about in the context of, of what we are, are currently facing in the world right now. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, Michelle, how has coronavirus been affecting you and your family? Well, I, I feel I'm fortunate that it is affecting me, but no one has died. No one has gotten ill in my family. Um, although I have family members that are going through um, uh, their own physical challenges. I have an older brother that's struggling. He has cancer. And I have a younger sister that has cancer. And so for them, there's a lot of anxiety. Um, even though, you know, they're in that mode of having to get treatment, there's that risk of them actually getting sick. And potentially, they're at higher risk because of their immune system. So that is always on my mind. And we do, you know, kind of daily check-ins just to chat to see how things are going. And then I have my daughter who has a child that's only 15 months old and not being able to see her and see him has been heart breaking. Um, heart wrenching at times, um, but thank God for the phones. We have the ability okay. to do FaceTime and get some type of connection, but it's really, really intense. The energy that I feel as an empath is so intense at times. I sometimes want to go lay down like just like crawl into the bed and just pull the covers over my head and be like, call me when it's over. <laughs> I said that to my husband. I'm like, can you just call me when it's done? He's like, what do you mean? Call me when it's done. <laughs> He's like, I can't do that. He's like, I'm not going to call you when, when it's done. <laughs> He's like, it's not going to be done, you know? And so I have that feeling that, you know, I just want to escape. Uh, it's just, it's pretty intense um, to have to be going through this. And um, I'm really grateful that I have a home, that I have access to food, that um, I have my meditation practice, that I have the skills and the tools to work with my mind so I don't lose my mind, you know? Um, but there's, it's still challenging. Just because you know I have my tools doesn't mean I don't still feel like overwhelmed, you know, and trapped like an animal in my own house because I can't. I mean, yes, you can go outside, and yes, you can wear your mask and all of that. But basically, it, it's just you're at risk, plain and simple. So that's always in the background. So a lot, a lot of really being grateful. I've really, I've pra I'm practicing my gratitude practice like three or four times a day instead of once a day. <laughs> I'm like, I'm definitely up there. I like, I was just doing it in the morning and then at night. Now I'm doing it morning, noon, and night. It's, it's hard. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You're, you're the first guest in this series who has asked me that. <laughs> um, uh, am I being unfair there? Uh, possibly someone has. But I don't think, I think we, we've, we've talked about it, but I don't think somebody's asked. So thank you for asking. Uh, generally speaking, 
not that much has changed for us. Um, I've done a lot of, of work from home anyway with uh -huh. these calls and writing and filming videos and stuff like that. So that is still in place. Um, yeah. All I've really lost from a sort of kind of professional sense is my in-person workshops, my in-person events. Can't do those anymore. Um, but apart from that, everything else is still in place. And I've now just transitioned to doing the same stuff, but in an online format, teaching it online as opposed to in person, which is not a hundred percent substitute, but Hey, you know what? It's, it's actually pretty good. Um, all things considered, mm -hmm. uh, for us personally, uh, my wife usually doesn't work from home. So we're kind of a, adjusting to that a little bit and sort of like getting the schedule of, of when she's doing a call, when I'm doing a call, uh, and she's working in the living room at the moment. So if I want to go to the kitchen, I have to go through the living room to have to make sure she's not on a call and, and all these kind of things. So we're kind of acclimatizing to being in the house together a lot more than, than we usually are. Mm -hmm. Personally speaking, we're largely just affected the same as everyone else. We actually, we went into isolation a little bit earlier because she was displaying symptoms. So we went into isolation about uh, probably about nine or 10 days before kind of the government enforced isolation mm -hmm. came in. So we've, we've been isolating for about four weeks now. So we kind of have our isolation routine, like fairly sort of like set in. Yeah. Um, and then we're just sort of personally affected how everyone is at the moment, the restrictions on, on going out and um, no one in our family at the moment is, is ill with it. We do have, members of the family who are kind of struggling or vulnerable um so we're looking after my my wife's granny who's uh 91 um so we're kind of getting her shopping and stuff like that and then just sort of keeping everyone else's spirits up in in sort of friends and family social circles um but yeah like largely speaking not that it's not affecting us uh but i think i would you know i would be really yeah, I would just be, I'd be lying and dramatic if I said we were really adversely affected by it because we're not, we're, we're no more affected than anyone else. And, and we're actually really good compared to other people. My wife's got a government job. So as long as the government is still there, she, she still has a job and still has money coming in. And I've been able to, to continue my income through online mediums as opposed to in-person mediums so yeah like really we have very little to worry about as long as we're not sick and as long as anyone we know doesn't get sick it's it's i say just in air quotes just the isolation that we're kind of coping with mm -hmm. yeah that's great you are very very lucky very lucky yeah but i, yeah. I can relate to you know my husband's in the house and me in the house too like so i'm upstairs i have we have a um, like a meditation slash office this is my closet back here <laughs> Walk in closet and so we've turned it into a meditation slash office and downstairs yeah. we have a living room and a kitchen all on one floor and so when he's in the kitchen he has his computer in the dining room. So if I come downstairs, he could be on the, the computer. So I can relate to that. And um, so it's, it's, it's all doable. It's not the end yeah. of the world. Yeah. You know, it's not the end of the world. It's just the world is changing, you know? Yeah. And yeah. we're ready. We're ready for the change as we... Um, contemplate that the change is here you know it, it's like, it's almost in some ways it's like being pregnant you know and waiting for the baby to be born into your life and how your life is different mm -hmm. right you know it's different you're not going to have the same schedule probably you probably won't do the same things that you normally would have done without the baby <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just, it's going to be different. Yeah. But I'm very hopeful yeah, that humanity is showing me, I'm seeing 
humanity show me that people are kind, people are helpful. And um, there's some amazing doctors and nurses out there that are so, so dedicated and committed to making sure that we know what they need in order for them to um, actually take care of people, take care of themselves and take care of the people that are coming to them. And I think the media, I know a lot of people don't like the media, but I think the media is showing the good and the bad and the ugly, you know, and that's what the media is supposed to do. I don't watch, um, you know, I don't, I don't watch a lot of the media. I was saying that to my husband, like I can only literally have like an update about it. And then I have to kind of stay away from it because I feel like for me, I'm an empath and it's just too much. It's too much for me to hear, um, you know, when they're, especially when it feels like there's a lot of alarming going on and, and kind of blaming whoever they want to blame the president or whatever, you know, that doesn't matter in the long run. It matters, but it doesn't matter right now. You know what I mean? Like I, it's all about the present moment coming back to the present moment to remember short period of time. We're only on this planet earth for a short period of time. We're all going to die someday. You know, as a meditator, as a Buddhist, we meditate on the fact that we're going to, leave this planet earth you know and this whole thing this whole life itself is really a dream you know so you better do something of meaning for yourself it's, it's that's that's really kind of how i feel about collectively like what are we going to do how am i going to be helpful yeah. how can i help you you know so I remember you used the words tools earlier, Michelle. Do you have any suggestions for tools that people can use to get through this current situation? Yes, I have a lot of tools and I would love to share my, I have three tools. They're meditations that you can listen to. I have a gratitude meditation. I have a body scan meditation, which actually helps you with um, anxiety and sleep. And I also have another challenge. It's called the Joy Map Challenge to help you practice joy. So I do have some juicy tools for you and oh, your nice. audience. Cool. Well, we'll, uh, we'll pop those. I presume they're, they're links to the audio files. We can pop those mm -hmm. in the show notes and people can listen to their heart's content. Do you have any other um, sort of actionable things that, that people can do, practices, changes, anything like that? Well, I think, I think mainly right now during this pandemic, I think the first thing that people really, really should try to do is really connect with each other in any way that they can, whether it's FaceTime or on the computer um, and really kind of step that up. I mean, I know sometimes generationally, like I have some clients that are kind of resistant in, you know, doing FaceTime with me or um, a Zoom call or something like that. It's really, really helpful to just jump on a FaceTime or Zoom. And if you can't do that, you're, you're resistant or technology-wise, you can't because you just can't get it together. You know, actually talking, talking to people, calling somebody and talking to them and listening to them, you know, just be a good listener. And um, I think that's really, I would say, a big thing um, that I would recommend. 
because we, we all really need to be seen and heard and loved. And um, that's what we can do. Do you think there are any opportunities available in the current crisis? Oh, yes, definitely. There's all kinds of opportunities in really stepping up your own ability to donate to, um, you know, the CDC, if that would be something that you would be highly motivated to do to help with, um, you know, the crisis and getting the right medicine so they can start testing to see who has the virus. I mean, there's a lot of things that people can do. You know, it's just what they feel comfortable doing and, 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 and investigating that. Um, I, I see a lot of that online now. People are starting to like, you know, for their birthdays saying, you know, donate money to mm -hmm. like, whether it's, you know, breast cancer or, you know, um, the CDC um, or even just, you know, depending on what's important to you, you know, it could be something for children, you know, keeping the children safe. So there's, there's a lot that we can do and partake in. Mm -hmm. Well, Michelle, I'd like to start bringing everything that we've been talking about today full circle. And to do this, I'd like to, to swap the role. And you've actually preempted this today because you asked me a question. And uh, it's, <laughs> it's not often that guests do that. So I appreciate that. Uh, but generally speaking, I've been the one asking the questions. And I'd want to give you another opportunity to ask a question. But this time, it's not to me. Mm -hmm. It's to our audience. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question you'd like to ask our audience today? Or... Is there a question you think the audience should be asking themselves? Hmm. That's a really good question. I like that question. I would have to say, for the audience to actually ask themselves, how can I be helpful during this time? How can I be helpful? It's a simple question, but I think there's never a better time than to really start, start with that being helpful. As I, I feel that we just, we need all the help that we can get right now. Whatever that person's strength is in your audience, how can they really step up and serve and be helpful in whatever it is? I know that people that, like Oprah, you know, she... Um, donated, I think it was, she donated so many, so much money for, um, for the ventilators or something like that. You know, I mean, if, if you're capable of doing that, how, you know, do it. You know, how can you be helpful? If you don't have the money, then think about other ways. Well, Michelle, for our audience who've been listening today and they have connected with a part of your story or your message or your philosophies and insights, and they want to find out a little bit more about who you are and what you do, where would you be directing them to go? They can find me at the juliangoddesscoaching.com. It's my web website. And you can jump on a, I call it a tea chat with me, or you can message me in Messenger. And that's all on the website. 
if you even if you Google me, if you Google Michelle Julian, Julian Method, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, all of the things <laughs> that I was resistant to <laughs> until five years ago. Um, you you can find me. <laughs> it's with one L though. Michelle with one L, <laughs> Julian. Well, Michelle, I'd just like to, to thank you for coming on the podcast today. I think you are someone who has approached their life in a very candid way. And when these various experiences have come up and they have given you some kind of message or, or some kind of impetus, you've taken the time to assess that and to listen to it. And most importantly, to act upon it. And even though you've had several to kind of remind you of the message, every time it's come, you have returned to the message, implemented mm -hmm. and, and acted upon it from that point forward. And that's what has come across to me today in our conversation. I just want to mark that and acknowledge that here today. Thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you. To continue to help you through this isolation period, I've decided to open up my Author Your Life Academy for free for the next three months. Author Your Life is my online educational community where you can access training sessions, workshops, and question and answers, and connect with other people around the world who are going through this situation and trying to make the best of things. The Academy normally costs $27 a month to subscribe, but for the next three months, I'm going to open that up for free. Essentially, you're getting a free month free trial of the platform. To access the Author Your Life Academy, go to authoryourlife.org forward slash academy and when prompted, enter the code CORONA in block capitals. Yes, what else would the code be? CORONA in block capitals and that will take your $27 subscription down to zero for the next three months. The Academy is where I'm going to be focusing a lot of my content during this difficult time. It's where I'm trying to bring people together to help and support each other as we go through this period of isolation, of fear, of uncertainty, I hope the Academy is something that will be able to help you too during this situation. So if you want to come in and join us, as I said, go to authoryourlife.org forward slash academy and when you sign up, enter the code CORONA and that will give you three months for free. It's my gift to you to try and help and support during this time as best I can. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd appreciate it hugely if you could head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the podcast. With your review, please be as honest and detailed as you can be. Because with honest and detailed feedback, that helps me to adapt and grow this podcast to most serve you, the listener. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, then make sure you subscribe to the podcast that way you aren't going to miss any of the future episodes that we've got lined up for you. Until next time, remember that you are the author of your life. You hold the pen and you can write whatever script you want for yourself. So go out today and write yourself a beautiful story. <laughs>